Thanks. Good evening, uh, everybody, and uh, on behalf of CRASH, welcome to this third installment of the Humanitas series, Old Masters Fit for the Future. I'm Alex Maher from the Department of History of Art, and it's my pleasure to welcome again our Humanitas visiting professor, from Pibes, in conversation with Dr. Emily Ugordenka. Um, the Humanitas uh, series of visiting professorships at Oxford and Cambridge is designed to bring leading academics, practitioners, and scholars to both universities to address major themes in the arts, social sciences, and humanities. It was created by the late Lord Weidenfeld, and the program is managed and funded by the Weidenfeld Hoffman Trust with the support of uh, a series of generous benefactors. And we're extremely grateful to the Trust for their support, and to J.E. Safra, who has generously funded this particular Humanitas <laughs> series. Uh, I'm very pleased indeed to introduce again uh, Wim Pipes, who is General Director of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Dr. Pipes studied art history, film studies, and philosophy at the University of Groningen. He began his career in Rotterdam, organizing a series of international exhibitions on 17th century Dutch art and Dutch design. He joined the Kunsthalle in Rotterdam as exhibitions coordinator in 1996, becoming its director in 2000, a post he held until moving to the Rijksmuseum in 2008, where he undertook a major renovation of the museum, which we'll be hearing about shortly. Dr. Pipes chairs the boards of numerous distinguished organizations, including the Rembrandt Society. He writes regularly for periodicals and the Wiki Press, contributes to arts programs, and has written two children's books on looking at art. Uh, but not least amongst his accomplishments, he chairs tastings and juries on culinary heritage, including Herring and Yenova. Uh, we're very fortunate indeed to have him in Cambridge for this series of events. And likewise, we're delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Emily Gordenka, who is director of the Royal Picture Gallery of, of the Maritzhaus. Uh, Emily earned her PhD in 1998 from the Institute of Fine Arts in New York University with a speciality in the history of 17th century Dutch and Flemish art, the history of dress of that period, and the artist Anthony van Dyck. Uh, her wonderful dissertation, Van Dyck and the Representation of Dress in 17th Century Portraiture, was published in 2001. While in New York, Emily worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, the Frick Collection, and the Netherlands Institute for Art History. She's taught at several universities, including Rutgers, uh, NYU, Vassa, and the Bard Graduate Center for the Decorative Arts. Uh, I first met Emily when she was uh, senior curator for early Netherlandish Dutch and Flemish art at the National Gallery of Scotland in Edinburgh, a post she took up in 2003 before moving to the Maritz House as director in 2008. And there she led a major renovation, an expansion of the museum, completed on time in June 2014, a rare accomplishment. She continues to publish scholarly articles, create exhibitions for the museum, and serves on several boards. And our two guests are going to be speaking today to the theme, Old Masters Fit for the Future. So please join me in welcoming Humanitas Visiting Professor Wim Pipes and Dr. Emily Gordenka. Thank you. Well, as I, as I mentioned, this is, this is the third in a series of events. On, on Friday evening, uh, Vim gave a wonderful lecture in which um, he said that although he uses the phrase old masters, he doesn't really believe there's any such thing. Only contemporary artists who have passed into history and need to be made relevant for today and for the future. So I wonder if we could just begin, uh, starting with you, Wim, and then um, passing over to you, Emily. Wim, could you just say a little bit about uh, what that means for you, the idea that old masters are really, have always been contemporary painters, and, and how that informed the decisions that you took mm -hmm. at the Rijksmuseum in the major development? Yeah, I will do that. First, my question to the audience would be that, who of you have been to the uh, lecture on the Friday? <laughs> so most of you, okay, but not everybody. So um, that's that's the first question. Second question would be, uh, who of you have been to the Rijksmuseum? That's good. Oh, that's almost everybody. And who of you have been to the Maurits House? Very good. <laughs> so then we know who is in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there we go. Um, no, old masters, I, I, um, I'll repeat myself, maybe. But uh, anyway, to me, indeed, old masters are something very contemporary. Because if I go to an old master, 
what is called and uh, entitled as an old master exhibition, I think, okay, we live in 2016, and the art and the artist on the wall in the gallery is speaking to me and is relevant for me as a 2016 person. So what do I see? I see maybe an, an, an image from made in another time than, than we live in, though the message and maybe the beauty even that I, that I, that I look at is, is valuable for me. It, the, 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 the story that is told is valuable for me. The, 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 the story that is told uh, is, 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 is still relevant for me. It could be about uh, beauty or about vanity or about honesty or about anything that, that is still human, uh, timeless, and maybe even universal. So in that sense, I would say that Rembrandt is, uh, is a contemporary master because he still speaks to me as if it was made yesterday or even today. So, um, and, and when I took upon the task of becoming the director of the Rijksmuseum, my idea was to have this uh, concept of, of, of what is contemporary and what is old, something from a past period behind, how can I make uh, the collection of the Rijksmuseum relevant for today's audience? And the easy thing to do that was to declare anything contemporary. So it's, it's not a, a marketing trick, not at all, but it's, it's a way of thinking and um, and you can agree with it or not, but uh, that's the way I, I really believe it, and that's also the way we we uh, well we did it. Thank you. So, so your your appeal was to a certain timelessness, yeah. key qualities that run throughout history, beauty, vanity, definitely a human. Well, 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 time timeless, but as well universal. So, I mean, Rembrandt never would have thought that that people from China or Japan or India or Brazil or whatever would come to museums like the Mauritshuis or the Rijksmuseum or the National Gallery, whatever museum, and to, to enjoy and to buy a ticket to, well, to go see a painting that is obviously not made for them, but for somebody else, but it speaks to them. So it's timeless and universal, so. Timeless, universal, global. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we agree on some issues. Uh, certainly our mandate to make old master paintings, I'll come on to that in a moment, relevant today to today is, it's fairly obvious what we do. Uh, the use of the world old masters is to a certain extent semantic. I think it's born out of, as many of you art historians here know, it comes from art history. It's a category. Yeah, sure, we can argue about whether the category is relevant, where it stops, where it ends. Um, uh, but I, I think it is interesting because it helps to set out your profile. What type of collection do you have? What can people yeah. expect? So for better or for worse, we have this term, and I would say, why not use it? The point that you make about uh, making them relevant and, and making them um, interesting to today's viewer, I would agree. There are artists who fit into that very easily. You say Rembrandt. Uh, there are also artists, Dutch artists, tend to be easier, tend to have genre painting or, or subjects that are very recognizable to us today. It's quite different in Italian paintings of the period or French paintings. But you know, we also have artists like Gerard de la Reche who do highly classical subjects that are quite remote to us. So to circle back, I would say one could make a virtue of the fact that these are old masters. And in fact, that historical distance has something very intriguing and appealing to us, especially when you can make that link, as you said earlier, to uh, something that appeals today, whether it's a theme or a story. So we're in a time, we like stories. We like to see our films on, on, our, on our new media sites. Um, if you can find a hook or Another way of putting it, if we as art historians, as museum people, can translate those stories into an idea, a language that 
will really have a resonance today, that's when we're successful. And they could be themes like Vanitas, they could be a beautiful flower painting, but they could be incredibly complicated classical stories that may just, or history paintings, that may just strike a chord today. And I think that's really what we need to be doing in order to keep these paintings alive. So Emily, you, you see your mandate, your mission, to make all the old masters in your care fit for the future, no matter the subject, no matter their position in the hierarchy or the supposed hierarchy of artists, whether it's a, whether it's a Rembrandt or a, a, a Larisse. So nothing wrong with him. <laughs> nothing, wrong, nothing, nothing wrong with him. Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, I think uh, what's important to note uh, at this point is that um, we have very different collections and very different mandates. Um, I like to characterize the Rijksmuseum as the department store of Dutch uh, museums. They do everything to use a classic American 1950s expression. They do soup to nuts, beginning to the end. And we're the boutique. All we do is paintings, only paintings from Northern Europe with, a, with an emphasis on Dutch from about 1400 to 1750. So we have this incredibly uh, clear and specialized mind. And within that range, sure, there's quality, there's Vermeer, or there's Rembrandt, there's also maybe you know, less interesting works, but all of those can become interesting for one reason or another, or can tell a narrative that can help people to um, appreciate and maybe even reflect on their lives today. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on, on some of those, those differences between the collections that Emily's brought up and, 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 and how, she said, the, the, the soup to nuts aspect of the Hikes Museum, its vastness, uh, and, and also the obligation as the major state museum to tell certain stories about the Dutch past, how that's informed your role as director and, and, and what you've done with the museum? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's the, the, the Mauritshuis and the Rijksmuseum, they're, they have similarities, though they, they have more things different than in common. I mean, yes, we also do have Dutch masters, but we have a million objects, which is incredibly large. So we have coins, we have costumes, we have prints and drawings, we have um, weapons, we have, well, shipping models, we have historical objects, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, like, like in other countries, you have the Frick versus the Metropolitan, or you have the Wallace versus the, 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 the British Museum. You have small specialist museums with a, with a certain history, with a certain specialism even, and you have this large department store um, a kind, of, kind of museums, and they both exist for different reasons, uh, and, of course, uh, and they both fulfill a different mission. And uh, the, the, though at that, also on that level, there are, there are similarities and, and differences. And I think it's good to, to have both at the same time. If you, see, if you want to see Rembrandt in, in the context of the Rijksmuseum, you might, s you know, of course, you see the same artist as the Rembrandt in the Maurits house, but at the same time you, 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 you experience him in a different context and in a different background and therefore you will see to a certain extent a different side of Rembrandt as with us. So that, I think that, that's, that, that makes it interesting. I mean, to see, uh, to see the same artist and, me, and maybe even the same kind of picture in a in, in one museum and to see the same kind of thing in a museum that's completely different. So, and that's always enriching your, your view on an artist. So th for that reason, I always find it very interesting to see pieces from our collection in, in traveling shows on, or, or, or loan exhibitions to see our works working, if I may put it that way, in, in a complete new context. That, that, that's always good, so the both work. Mm. You mentioned that, you know, you just continue this, this metaphor, the shopping metaphor. There are often, there's Forgive often, me, I worked at Bloomingdale's once upon yeah. a time. So. <laughs> You're often gonna have a, a different kind of appeal to a different kind of customer. Sure. You'll have different kind of customers who go to a big department store, different kind of customers to a boutique store, but sometimes those two sorts of, of shop are in competition with one another. 
for the same customers. Is that the case at all in the relationship between the Rijksmuseum and the Mahatshaus? Now, you two are old, are old friends, so obviously not between the individual I would, di I wouldn't di call directors. It, I, I wouldn't call it competition. I, I mean, people go for different reasons to different museums. And um, I mean, there are forms of competition, uh, obviously, but not, not in terms of visitors. I mean, when things are good for Rembrandt or Vermeer or the Maurits House, it means it's good for the art world as such. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, it's the same as things are good for the art world because we do good acquisitions or we do good ex exhibitions or whatever in the Rijksmuseum. It all helps the whole public domain of the non-profit, both non-profit art world as such. So, yeah, competition in visitors' terms, I don't, I don't think we, we have to compete. And we, we're not competing in that. I think it's a really, it's a, I think it's a relevant question. I think uh, that our attitude, as you can tell, is very friendly and open. Uh, you can also hear I'm American, I'm half American, half Dutch, and my American side thinks a little competition is probably a good thing, yeah. keeps you sharp, no problem there. Uh, but you don't want to get in each other's way. And in fact, what we have found, uh, if I may, in contrast to a generation before us, where it was often, you know, it was tough, we have a very good open, uh, line and I think we both see it the same way if I may yeah. uh, uh, one can you, you there's a good word in Dutch you fill a car and you, you fill you you complement each other that's what I'm looking yeah. for and that's I think the optimal situation a little bit of you know oh, you're gonna get that show or that that's fine but as long as you don't start to sort of bother the visitors or um, and as long as you can work together on, on the real work which is the research side of what we do right Indeed, and of, and of course, you know, if you want to go and see Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring, you have to go to the Mahatshaus, but you're now selling postcards of that picture in your shop. And I think you even have a poster uh, if, saying, if you want to see this picture, go to the Mahatshaus. Well, well, it's, well, in, it's, actually, not, it's not no. a poster. Emily brought some pictures. I brought a picture. Let me see if I can find it. Forgive me, I need to scroll so down. I, I will tell about it. Now, there was in, in the past, a long time ago, well, not so long time ago, there was indeed that, I mean, <laughs> D don't talk about the girl with the pearl in the Rijksmuseum. It was a taboo. Uh, so I took this picture <laughs> in their shop. This was before our building Long project. Before <laughs> I, so what happened is that, that people, I mean, this is about the power of the icon. Uh, and we're going to talk about it later, maybe. But anyway, so people go to the, the Rijksmuseum, and they have seen, we have four Vermeers, so they have seen the milkmaid and, and, and the, the love letter, etc. So they saw the Vermeers, and they come in the shop, and they want to, to have a souvenir, so they buy the cards with the girl with the pearl because they they so much enjoyed that painting so <laughs> and more than once a day that this happens so in the shop they are they say we're not selling that card because the painting that you talk about is not in the Rijksmuseum. museum it's in the Maurits house so shame on you you haven't seen it right blah 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 but so nowadays we sell all Vermeer cards available in the world uh, because if people want to buy a card by Vermeer, I'm fine. So, uh, and including the girl with the pearl, of course. Mm -hmm. Very good. <laughs> uh, but this does illustrate a point that was, um, for me at least, really homework. I arrived in The Hague in 2008, a very good museum, successful museum, somewhat um, turned inward, um, a little bit sleepy. And this was in the Rijksmuseum, and this was to me my homework. It was important to let people know that there are other, with all respect to other museums besides <laughs> the Rijksmuseum, that there is uh, that going to the Netherlands doesn't just mean going to Amsterdam. It's always a yeah. bit of a challenge for us, and um, that uh, how you pronounce the Maurits House that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my my point is seriously, you know, how do you put yourself on the map? Yeah. And um, so this to me was indication that we hadn't done it yet, and. You know, we've come a long way, but I think we have more work to do in this regard. And, and obviously, having great iconic paintings like Girl with the Pearl Earring, like The Night's Watch, these can be a great benefit to any museum mm -hmm. in attracting visitors. But it can also be a burden, mm -hmm. can, as we as we know with the Louvre, with the Mona Lisa, that a museum can be no. can come no. to be identified just with a single a single work. Yes, so, yes, and no. 
So what, 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 I mean, yeah. you, you, you've used, you've used I mean, the, word, the word icon. And, and yeah, it's, and it's yeah I, I was so also talking about that on Friday. And, and I think it also has to do with the, this whole phenomenon of, of internet. I mean, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're on the internet and you read a newspaper, you have this, this column, most read articles. So one, two, three, four, five. And what, what normally happens is that the number one article is clicked, this whole clickbait idea of, okay, this, so that must be interesting because it's number one. And because it's number one, people click on that. So the number one will be the enormous number one because this whole phenomenon of, of, of being number one, being the largest, being the iconic article of the New York Times or whatever newspaper it is, 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 is growing just by the system of this whole internet way of, of thinking and ranking. Uh, well, that's the time we live in. So, and it, the same phenomenon I, uh, I see in, 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 in museums or in, in music, uh, Spotify things, uh, most wanted today or most favorite song, whatever. You also see that in, 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 in paintings in the galleries. And yes, it's good if you have an icon but the icon could become indeed a kind of burden because everybody wants to see that icon first. And having seen that, it's on the bucket list, so it's, it's done. I'm happy that the Nightwatch is quite a large painting, um, comparing that to the Mona Lisa, which is only, if I'm right, like this. So, yeah, it doesn't make sense to stand in front of it with, with 200 or 300 people at the same time. Um, and it will be more in the future. But what I see the last 10, 20 years, that these icons are more and more becoming iconic uh, because of this whole phenomenon. If, if it's good or not, it's, and I don't have an answer on that, on that, on that thing, but it's, it's also with you. I mean, being well, in the Maori house. I'm showing a photograph yeah. here of the girl with pearl earring in Tokyo. Yeah. Uh, this uh, painting went to Tokyo with 49 other works from our collection and we were getting upwards of 10,000 visitors a day. It was the most visited <laughs> exhibition in the world. So, you know, this, a painting like this has the real power to attract. Uh, I should say, shortly after that, it was at the Frick Collection and the goldfinch was there. Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting because Donna Tartt's novel yeah. had just appeared. So all of a sudden, people who had may originally have come for the one work were distracted and realized there was more there. I, I was delighted by that because you saw people literally blogs mm -hmm. like, oh, there's Rembrandt. Um, so, you know, it absolutely can be a logistical nightmare, which is, yeah. I think, what you're describing. Um, but, you know, I think you could also, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a luxury problem. I mean, it's a problem a lot of people would like to have. And I think it behooves us as museum directors to, to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the Mars House is a very small building. Uh, for those of you who haven't been there, I can show you an image in a moment. It's not big. And the fire regulations dictate that you can only have about 500 people in there at one time. So I have said, very, I'm very contrary museum director, I've said, you know what, it's not all about getting as many people through the door as possible. It has to be a good experience so that you don't have, I mean, this is to me a nightmare scenario. <laughs> Um, we have relatively small rooms, and if it gets too crowded, we stop people from coming in. So we, if we, and we explain to them why. And people <laughs> will understand that if you explain it. So, so, so it, this is a, to get back to the whole idea of mission, you can say, right, we want to get as many people through the door as we can. It's out of our control, you know, the, the press is hyping this. But you can also, as a museum, and I think we're going to increasingly have to do this go going forward, is really think about, how you accompany your visitors so that they actually get some sense of the authenticity of that work of art. So obviously, in, in the case of the Maritz House, you're constrained. You're, you, you know, you, you, you're, you're for, your hand is forced, in a way, to... Yeah, to use it shamelessly. Use it shamelessly. <laughs> how, how, how do you feel about this issue of, of visitor numbers? I mean, we've talked a little bit yeah. about, about yeah, yeah. blockbusters, but... I mean, do museum directors have a responsibility, actually, especially in this age of celebrity paintings and yeah. growing visitor, visit numbers, actually to limit numbers, yeah. uh, 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 to magnify the experience of a smaller uh, number of people and, and to perhaps to introduce research to them, to introduce them to new non-celebrity painters, yeah, objects. That, that, would, that might be, uh, I mean, if you go to the Rijksmuseum, the Gallery of Honor, I mean, the best visited 
cabinet is obviously the, the cabinet with, with the Vermeers in it. At the same time, um, even with, 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 with uh, peak days with, with over 10,000 visitors in the Rijks, the 18th century or, or ceramics is still, there's still nobody. So there are indeed silent uh, galleries uh, and one floor up, it's, it's, it's crowded like, like the image in, in Tokyo. But um, yes, there is a responsibility by the directors, who else? To, uh, to make decisions, though it's not so easy because what I said earlier, people want to see and more and more the same thing. And, and the, the, the celebrity paintings, as you call them, uh, indeed are the stars of the show, whether you like it or not. And indeed, it's a strange phenomenon going to the Mona Lisa, standing in queue in this, in this gallery of, of Italian painting, and you pass by two other Leonardos which nobody is looking at because everybody's just going for that one, that one single picture in, at, the end of the, at the end of the gallery, which is the, the Mona Lisa. So I don't know what the answer will be. I just note that figures to, visitors' figures are, are going up all the time, every year, again and again. In London, over, it doubled within 10 years. Um, also, the Rijksmuseum has is doubled in, in uh, after the renovation, comparing to the old uh, situation. Um, all new museums that are opening up have more f visitors than in the past. I was in China the other day, and I was told that Chinese tourism has not even started. I mean, everybody's talking about the Chinese are coming, they are coming, they are there. No, it hasn't started yet. So if they really are coming, um, I don't know what happens. I mean, uh, if, if you look at, at smaller museums and not the Mauritshuis, but for instance, the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam, they really see this summer for the first time and they're open every day till 10 o'clock or even 12 o'clock at night that it is sold out. And sold out mm -hmm. is a phenomenon that is not so often used in the, in the world of visual arts in museums, but in the performing arts, yes, concerts are sold out. So maybe in the future, and that future might be within 10 years, uh, that a museum could be sold out on, on certain days to guarantee, what Emily says, to guarantee at least uh, an enjoyable museum visit because more and more, yeah, to a certain extent it's impossible because of safety but also because, yeah, why do you come to a museum to see a painting and to have an enjoyable visit? So there's a, there's a risk that if your blockbuster exhibition is sold out, that you as a yeah, director well. become a, a seller. Well, well, but the, the, the important point here I think that we need to make is there, there are also, you've got a lot of stakeholders you have to report to, and one of the big ones for us anyway is the Ministry of Culture. So, you know, or your, your, say your sponsor of your exhibition, if they want a certain visitor figure, or if you promise that, you've got to deliver. So there is a tension there, um, I think, between your own aims and those aims that you, that you have to, and particularly, um, I, I should put this slightly differently, the, the issue that's very difficult for all of us is to come up with goals that you can quantify. It's very easy to count the number of visitors who come through the door, but actually when you think about it, just the pure number, it's not that interesting. You know. It depends how many visitors per object, per square meter, per how many came last year versus this year. Uh, what kind of visitors are you having? I mean, then you're starting to have a conversation about something, but just pure number by itself really doesn't mean a whole. I'll give you an example. I got a phone call from a journalist who said, "Oh, you know, you had 500,000 visitors, you're, or 600,000. You're you're approaching the State Lake Museum." And I said, "You know, listen, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's a silly question." Of course, the article came out with a big headline that said exactly that. But, you know, it, it just it doesn't mean anything. So I think it's the, 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 the thing that we're grappling with is how do you say, well, um, my aim is to do such and such, and how do you, you attach a certain level of quantifiable goals that they're quite easy to understand that you can deliver to your various stakeholders and say, you know, this was a success for these reasons. It's always, it's always clearly a, a, a negotiation with, mm -hmm. a, with many different moving parts. But I just want to stick for, for a, a minute with, with this issue of, of icons, old masters mm -hmm. as, as icons, and, and what the future is. 
because at the moment, as I'm sure uh, many, of, many of us here know, uh, the V&A has an exhibition on Botticelli, Reimagined, which has taken yeah. the unusual step, not, not, of, not of starting with Botticelli in his own time, but Botticelli in contemporary culture, yeah. moving back through his rediscovery in the 19th century, and only then eventually do you reach Botticelli in the Renaissance. That's an embrace of Botticelli as brand and how that came into being. Is that the way to make old masters fit to the future, fit for the future? Or do you as directors have a responsibility to resist that kind of commodification? Good question. I, I, I saw the Botticelli exhibition in Berlin just before it came to London. And to me, it was not a tribute to Botticelli. Um, and I put it mildly. Um, who of you have seen the exhibition? So that's not so many for a Botticelli exhibition. And it doesn't surprise me, but because it, it yeah, isn't a Botticelli exhibition. And yet they, it's, they, they and, are, and that's exactly yeah, the yeah. point. I, you're right. I mean, it is, it is uh, making the, the Primavera a, a more iconic image than it already is. Uh, so, OK, that might be the theme for the exhibition. And the whole Botticelli Venus uh, thing. But there was so much on that exhibition too much to me that the quality of the painting was was brought down to a certain extent. I mean, it's, it could be interesting as a documentary for television or, or a book or whatever, but not as an exhibition. Mm. It didn't pay a right to, to, to the Botticelli thing. So to me, this is not, this is an example how I would not Okay, well, that's make, a, that's, make an that's, icon. That, that's a very, very clear statement. I haven't you? seen the exhibition, but I think that um, there are ways of um, taking icons and putting them to very good use. And, and I would think particularly about adding more depth. Yeah. There are ways that you know, pe people may know the girl with the pearl earring from the film. They may know the Night Watch from your photo with you with Obama in front of them. But I think what our mandate is, and we're both research institutions, you know, we, we, this part. The, the nerdy side. I mean, I'm, I've, you heard me. I worked hard. I did my dissertation. <laughs> that nerdy side needs to come through. And that can take an icon, what is already an icon, and give it context and give it depth and help, hopefully will help people understand why it appeals so much. And then take the next step to look beyond. That sounds quite, I don't mean to sound glib, because it, it, it is actually a lot harder than, than a statement like this. Um, it means really knowing your field, having outstanding researchers, but also researchers who can step out of themselves and think about the audience that they're addressing and think about innovative ways to make some of this scholarship and some of this knowledge come alive. And to me, that's the way that you deal with your icons. So how, how do you do it? How do you do it in an age of Twitter, limited attention span? Well, yeah, it, it, it's, that's, uh, you, you need a little bit of luck um, sometimes unexpected. For instance, uh, first it starts with a good image. I mean, with a good work of art. I mean, that's obviously, but okay, but that, that's, that's what you need first. I mean, but both of us have very strong images in the galleries, uh, so that's not, a, that's not the point. So, a strong image. Then you need a kind of, of moment in time that there is a certain demand for a kind of image, whatever it is, that has the pace of time that we live in, uh, for whatever reason. And then you need this, this, this luck factor that maybe your, this image is chosen as a theme for a film or a, or a book or a book cover. Um, and then it's, it goes up like that. And then repeat, 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 and again. And, and I believe that you can do, you can make some, some icons Though it's always difficult because at the end, the audience always decides what, what, if they accept it as an icon or not. But I'm sure you can you can you can manipulate it if you would use I, that word. I have an example um, of this, not necessarily creating an icon, but let me put it to you. I don't have an image with me, but there was a painting uh, that one of my very illustrious predecessors bought uh, at the end of the 19th century for his own collection as a, as a Rembrandt. And he would have been a very successful museum director in our time because he was all over the papers when he bought it. 
for a huge sum. Yeah. I mean, it's a big story about how he sold his horse and carriages. You know, he really was creating an icon yeah. in his own time. So in some ways, plus ça change. You know, it's the same thing as 100 years ago. This painting, uh, Saul and David, it's a large painting that shows King Saul with a large turban on his head, wiping his eyes on a curtain. And below him, uh, in the lower right corner of the, the painting, is the adolescent David who is plucking his harp. Large painting, two figures. 1969, the Rembrandt people, mafia, got to work and they deattributed it. It wasn't good enough. Take care what you say. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I've, I've, uh, I've studied this. Okay. Uh, 2007. The mafia. Uh, okay. 2007 comes. Uh, this was just before I arrived, and Marz has decided it was time to look at this painting. It was very dirty. It was very hard to read, um, and it was really with an eye to conservation treatment. Um, the reason I'm telling you all this story is that it took eight years to do the conservation's treatment and the studies, and it involved a huge team of specialists using the very latest technology. Does this make an icon? I don't know. But what we did was, um, I actually made an exhibition about this using all forms of films, touch pads, new, new media. The painting hung, had gloriously restored, hung on its own in a little space, and the rest of it was full of these narratives, these stories that can take a painting that might otherwise be dark and inaccessible and quite heavy, and it brought it to life. It had one very interesting history, been cut into pieces, put back together. We let loose all these new technologies on it. I had 16-year-old boys in there for over an hour. It worked. We had front page New York Times coverage of this project. You know, if you can find, I don't think it's just luck, Nim, I think if you no, can you need a good story. find That's true. a narrative, yeah. and if you know who your audience is, and you can, and, and you can bring the most complex materials, I mean, honestly, X-ray fluorescence scanning, it's not exactly a household world, but it became really, it, you could, it really gripped people. And there, to go back to my initial point, you know, we have, I think, a real mandate as museums to safeguard this knowledge, this expertise that we have, to involve outside researchers, to, but also our expertise is to understand our audience and to think with them and for them and listen to them and what appeals to them. And I think then you can start to broaden out from the, oh, I took a, photo, you know, a selfie in front of the, in front of wow. the milkmaid. Um, so that's at least what we're trying to do. Well, it's encouraging to know that there's still a role for research. Now, of course, we, we, we've talked a little bit about outside research projects, the Rembrandt Research Project being obviously a well-known example. Um, the attributions of your icons can change. Sure. Uh, in Rembrandt studies, this is a perfect example. We've seen it too recently in the Bosch exhibition. Um, oh works from the Prado were, uh, were not lent because of a deattribution or an attribution dispute. So um, what I want to ask you in this regard is you, you, you both engage with outside teams. You also have your own curators, so your directors with your own team of experts. To what extent do they and you determine attribution in your institutions? in relation to what goes on in the outside world. And by the outside world, I mean not just the academy, but also that scary word, the art market. Well, yeah, it's a good question. But I say that every, every attribution is, stands on itself. So it's, it's difficult to say, in general, what would be uh, some, some golden rule in, in attributing works of art to certain masters or, or vice versa. So we are very reluctant in, 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 in giving attributions because then somebody from the Rijksmuseum has said it is a this or that. So You mean uh, an, uh, from another collection or a private collection? Yeah, then? yeah. Uh, or, or private people who come in or send us pictures or whatever. I mean, it's happening all the time. I think it's the same with, with you. The Van Gogh Museum, for instance, did for a long time have the policy of not judging other Van Goghs except for their own, because they have Van Gogh uh, from all over the world coming, uh, 
people to their office with, with postcards or with the real works of art, whatever, and, and having a, a, a queue, whether if it's Van Gogh or not. I mean, it's, and it's normally it's not about Van Gogh or painting, it's always about money. So, um, and these two go hand in hand more and more. And so the Van Gogh is not, uh, their policy is, is to say, we're not gonna judge on other Van Goghs because we're not doing it at all, because there is this money side, and when there's money involved, there's also a legal side, um, and sooner or later you, you have dispute about whether if it's yes or no. So some of our curators are vetting in, uh, and it's uh, for, for art fairs, mm -hmm. and when they do, and I did it myself in the past, uh, you have to sign up that, that uh, everything that is in the vetting for the, for, for the art fair will not be disclosed afterwards. Because you can imagine that, that if there are attributions or not attributions to certain works, that these works that has been brought to the art fair by a dealer and they, they represent a certain value, that if some experts say, well, it's not a Van Gogh or whatever it is or should be, uh, yeah, it's, it has no value at that point. So it's a very, it's a tricky situation. very sensitive... I, I, yeah. uh, I take your question slightly differently. I think you may mean uh, about our own collections. Oh, okay, oh, sorry. Uh, okay. That's all right. Okay. Uh, we, I think uh, times have changed in this regard. Uh, as I mentioned with my story about Saul and David, it's no longer one man. And honestly, in Rembrandt's stories, it was one man in his study on his own said, it is or it isn't. We now need so much specialized equipment to evaluate things that this is a team effort. So things have changed enormously in that regard. Um, uh, I, I also think that I hate the word, but transparency is extremely important in all of this, so that if someone comes and questions uh, an attribution or has a reason to do that, you have to be open about that. We, we're art historians, we're scholars. I think we have a, a responsibility to know our field and to know what we're talking about. Uh, example is uh, the, self, the early self-portrait by Rembrandt, which hung for many, many years. Uh, beautiful early work in the Mars House as a Rembrandt. It was subjected to infrared um, reflectography. Turns out there's a very precise underdrawing under the painting, which means that, which is very uncharacteristic for Rembrandt. And there's a similar work in Nuremberg. The Nuremberg work is the original, ours is a copy. It's a very good copy, but we, we, we show it as a copy and we're completely open about that and have been for many years. So I think there, you know, the, the Rembrandt comes up often in this because he's a complicated artist, um, but in many ways, he, our, knowledge, our knowledge base has grown so exponentially. There are so many more factors to consider in these attributions. Uh, we know so much more about studio practice and materials that um, you know you really have to uh, reevaluate constantly, and, constantly. constantly yeah. changing, and it yeah. will keep yeah. changing as we so. develop new and new techniques and new materials. Yeah. To your point about um, externals, I think um, it's funny because, as you mentioned, I had an experience in Scotland, and I, I remember when I was a curator there, it was a normal mm -hmm. part of things that people come in with works of art, and you would. It was sort of like the Antiques Roadshow, you know, used to be there. Um, uh, and uh, to some extent, I, I, I think that as a public institution, it is your role to extend your expertise to people who come and ask for it. Um, but Vim is absolutely correct. It's become more complicated recently, especially with high value items. The policy that I maintain is that the curators who know a lot about the art that's presented to them may certainly form their opinion a uh, titre personnel. So it's their opinion, it's their own per it's not the opinion of the museum, it's their own opinion. And we never give a value. I don't no, know. Of course, no, of no, course. No, 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 no. We no. didn't in Scotland no. either. No. No. <laughs> so so uh, attribution is important. We've talked a bit about, about how technology has changed the way we look at attribution. And that's a big change. In, in, uh, every day, I mean, you, you have new techniques. Infrared, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Infrared yeah. reflectology, pigment analysis. Yeah. So, is it a problem that connoisseurship, as a field of endeavor, is increasingly on the wane in art history departments across the world? Does it matter? Yes, it matters. Sure, I mean, so connoisseurship is, is, is 
of its key, I mean, to anything that we do. I mean, not only attributions, but also to, to well, to, to have works in a context. I mean, it's not is it, if it's whether of yes or no, a Rembrandt or Vermeer or whatever, but connoisseurship, it starts with connoisseurship. Course. I mean, anything you We're do. going to agree wholeheartedly. Museum people will always say it's all about the object, stupid. You know, you need to know what you're yeah. looking at. You yeah. need to know how to look at it. You need to know how to place it into its right. material context. And I think, to be fair, you, you would be cheating your visitors if you didn't take it seriously. An anecdote, I, uh, when I was a graduate student in New York, I worked on an exhibition uh, that was entitled Rembrandt slash not Rembrandt. Sorry, we keep going back to Rembrandt, but he's the prime <laughs> example. And it resulted, there was a cancellation in their exhibition program, and they needed to think of something quickly. So the uh, director at the time, who I think was here, Philippe de Montebello, decided, well, maybe we can do something with the Rembrandts and talk about what's by Rembrandt and not by Rembrandt. And so he asked the curator at the time, who sadly died recently, Walter Liedke, and their chief uh, conservator to work together on this. And it was like boys in a sandbox. They could not agree. It was a disaster. So de Montemello took a very a Solomonic decision. He said, right, you each write your own catalog. We're going to sell it as a box set. <laughs> and I had the privilege of doing most of the sort of tours, the, the guided tours around, and it was so interesting to watch people. A very small percentage said, oh, I thought this was a Rembrandt show and it's not and I'm leaving. I want my money back, very New York. But most of them were absolutely, it was like, scales fell from their eyes. They, they really were thirsty to understand how we look at pictures, how we evaluate, they want the stories. And it's okay to talk about the gray area. And for me, this was an absolute formative experience. It was in 1995. And, and, and I think this also led to my, and I think you share this, is desire to open things out, not to keep it all secret and closeted. People really want to know it. So you know, for you art historians who are still learning, do learn how to look. And sometimes you yeah. don't know. It's OK. I mean, even the Rembrandt Research Project, the most esteemed specialists on Rembrandt, I mean, the, uh, within 10 years, they, they, they attributed, again, paintings that were rejected in the past and vice versa because of technique is changing and the, and, and the whole way of, of, of looking at Rembrandt changes as well. And new Rembrandts, strangely enough, they pop up sometimes. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, it's changing, it's, it's not, black and white, well, most of, it, most of them, it's, it's easy, it's yes or no, but this category in between, it's difficult to say that. Well, the, and there's also increasing, you know, there's a, hu a huge amount of knowledge now about how the studio practice was, yeah, the use of thing. materials, yeah. but also um, how the state of conservation can affect your opinion. Mm -hmm. This is a really quite recent phenomenon where you can say, you know, this may not look at first glance like it's by the master, but you know the top layer has been removed in a bad uh, conservation treatment in the past, or it's flat because it's not, it wasn't well relied. And when you take those other factors into account, you might come to a very different conclusion. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about, about conservation. Okay. Un under the, the heading of making pictures fit for the future, there are many, many different approaches. In the National Gallery, making pictures fit for the future means making them quite bright. In the Louvre, it means keeping them quite dark, um, not removing varnish, not removing patina. Depends, depends. So... It's changing. All the, it's also changing all the time. Uh, uh, in terms of conservation yeah. of pictures, the, you know, the, 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 the way that you clean them, the way that you, that you present them technically, what are your views? Uh, first of all, prepare yourself. Study, study, study. Find out as much as you can before you start doing anything. Um, and that is, again, has to, goes back to these new research techniques. Um, secondly, I think it's fairly obvious that anything that is done is entirely reversible. Yeah. Um, these are general rules. standard that, yeah, practice, yeah. And, and that really goes a long way towards assuaging um, any worries. Finally, yeah, it is, it is an aesthetic uh, and often an ethical decision how far you go. Um, and there, you're, if you've got a good team, uh, and for example, at the Mars House, we have our curators and, and conservators in the same department. They literally work together hand in glove. If you've got that good information, you're probably going to make a, a wise decision. But yeah. Reversible, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's key in this. I mean, anything that you touch, 
and, and my change on the original object um, should be reversible. And then the question comes, and coming back to the Louvre, what is part of the original object? Is that still the, uh, the, the, the original varnish that has been made in the 18th or 17th century, whatever painting it might be? So do you keep that intact, yes or no? Uh, and indeed, some, some arguments are to remove it and to replace it, and others are not. So, it, but it's, it's changing all the time. So co conservation is one thing. What about hang? Mm. What about display? Uh, I mean, I'm conscious that, that we've also been, changing we've, all the time. We've been talking. We've been talking for some time. Yeah. But both of you undertook major renovations, yeah. major rehangs of your collection. What are the key things? What were the key things in your minds as museum directors in relation to hang, in making your royal masters fit? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, what we did and what I explained on the Friday, I mean, since we have this collection, uh, historical collection and art collection, we decided, and my predecessors decided already with a whole team of curators to have this sense of beauty and awareness of time element as leading for all the, for the whole rehang of the Rijksmuseum and to have a, uh, a chronological order as leading principle, every floor a new era, a new age, so Middle Ages up to the 20th century. So you walk through this illustrated history of the Netherlands in an international context. That that's basically is what the New Rijksmuseum is about, and that's one thing. The second thing is that we selected only the best of the best, so we killed many darlings, so to say, and we have less works on show than in the past, which is a fun thing to say to the minister just when she was telling everybody very proud that we spent just 370 million and there's less to see than in the past. So, um, but indeed it works because uh, I think that it's not about more and more and more. I think the museum experience is getting better if you see only the best of the best. I mean, you can uh, now and then you go to these restaurants where they have a wine list thick like a phone book well, what is a phone book nowadays? But anyway, a book like this. Uh, phone books are not, well, anyway. So, but I only, if I have with one or two people, we drink only one bottle or whatever it is, but I don't want to have a, a wine list with, with, with an, an enormous list of, of wine. I mean, why? I mean, come on. So select only the best of the best. And, and no, that, that's what we did. And then on, about hanging, I like, I like low, hanging because then you you are more uh, in direct contact with the work of art so what is the what is the the the, the eye level of the paintings uh, I like a bit lower so one meter 55 is is the line where I like the paintings National this Museum geeky, of the National out. Museum of the country with the tallest population in the world yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, I think in some ways the Moritz House had been doing that for many years and the reason is that the building is very small. So again, I realize some of you have not been there yet. I would encourage you to come. One of our, it's a half an hour from Schiphol Airport. It's like not far. But the, the, one of the appeals, and this again is, gets to the boutique versus department store analogy. One of the great appeals of the Moritz House is it's, com it's, it's very easy to do in one visit. And, that selection, the, you know, our collection is very small. We have 850 paintings, and the quality is astonishingly high. So it means that even though it's a very small museum, I can play with the big boys and you know negotiate with the Prado or the Met. You know, it's a really, an, it's a very unique situation. So that means that that selection is quite difficult for us, but it is forced by you know, you've got a picture here of the Great Bull by Paulus Spulter. The, the, the uh, or uh, this is how we hang the girl. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, you know, this is our, um, the landing on the first floor. The building only has two floors and it only has, um, you know, a number of galleries. So it's, it's quite small. And we had been doing this for many years. Uh, but the tension for us was quite different, in fact. Um, uh, when we embarked on the building project, maybe it's useful if I just give a little background, if you don't mind, um, because it's confusing. This is the Mart's house uh, before we started the building project. And it's a question some of you may have heard me ask more often. But the question is, what's wrong with this picture? The 
the gates are really closed. It's like saying, you know, stay out. We're really scary. We're really elitist. Go away. So that needed to happen. And this is a picture of the old situation where you can see that it, it's really quite tired. There's a really anachronistic lamp hanging up there, and the, the wall fabrics were really tired. So it was, it, we, we knew something needed to happen. Um, it was a, a political moment, and this does come into play when people were saying, you have to renew everything. Everything has to be new. And as you may have gathered, I'm rather stubborn. And I said, no, you know what? If it's good, it's good. Where that girl hangs, it gives her context. It gives her that context I was mentioning before. Uh, unlike in Tokyo, where she's mobbed and she's at a distance, I wanted that proximity and that sort of domestic atmosphere to remain. That having been said, the lighting was awful. I mean, it, it, there was a lot to be done. And this is, in fact, was um, an, an answer to the problem of the closed gates. Uh, this is a building across the street that we were able to incorporate. And this is the design that we ended up uh, executing. So you can see the gates here are open. You come in through the forecourt. You go down into that new entrance area and back up into the Mart's house, which uh, this, is, uh, um, this is what it looks like now, which we kept largely as it was before. We replaced some colors. We have hugely improved lighting. But the hang, in many ways, is what it was. And so I resisted the temptation to change just for the sake of changing. And I think that's one of the things that gave us the most uh, accolades. But that even said, you're absolutely right. But it's, it's fresh. Now it's fresh. It, yeah, it had though, a face lift. Though the, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the hanging is, is almost the same as in the past. Though it is, as you say, the lighting is fresh, the Subtle background difference. is fresh. It, it is a yeah. you, you're opening, you're welcoming, and you, you enter the museum and you have another, another attitude engaging with the paintings. And, and that, and that, that is the essential thing, yeah. is not only you know, the presentation. So in the smaller the place, the more perfect it has to be, because you're completely under the, a microscope. You can't get away with many mistakes. And especially in The Hague, where I have a very loyal following of very mouthy friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so, you, you know, you really have to make sure that the, the, the presentation is perfect, the paintings are in perfect condition, that if you buy something new, that it really fits into the collection. But the attitude, how you go about it, for example, uh, we didn't want to put a lot of texts on the wall because it's a beautiful historic building, free app, every painting has a text, has an audio. It's simple stuff, but it's the things that really are an, indicate a willingness not only to extend information, but to hear something back from the visitors. Yeah. I'm conscious that uh, we want to have time for questions and answers Please, from, yeah. the, from the audience. But just one, one last quick question before we, before we move on to the Q&A. Um, Emily, you've just spoken about the jewel-like quality of your collection, retaining, uh, retaining a hang, a sense of, of historical authenticity. What role, if any, for contemporary art at the Maurits House, because we've heard Grim talk about freshening the Hikes Museum by introducing contemporary art. In thinking about how we make old masters fit for the future, is there a role for contemporary art? Absolutely. Uh, I invite you all to come to our next exhibition. I realize I haven't shown you a photograph of our exhibition space, but in the new wing we have one. Well, I'll show it later. Um, and that's a place where we can be playful, where we can do the, the, you know, the multimedia, where we can leave the, the permanent collection in its glory, but we can, we can you know, branch out a bit. This summer, I'm curating an exhibition, our first exhibition by a contemporary artist. Um, he is an internationally recognized artist from Brazil um, who is doing a show about the backs of paintings. And what he's essentially doing is reproducing in 3D, so they're real objects, um, what, a, especially an iconic painting, like the Mona Lisa, which is coming, and the, what they look like when you turn them around. So he's showing them not as images, but as objects, objects that get handled, that have hooks on their back, that people write over and lay, put stickers on. Um, and they're so uncannily exact that we can hardly tell the difference. He's done five on the basis of our collection. So yes, I think it depends a little bit on your collecting remit. Uh, Vim clicks right through the 20th century. I think contemporary art is essential for us as a way of looking. It's another perspective. It's going to reach another group of people who may otherwise think that the Mars house is stuffy and boring. Thank you. And Vim, is the future of Old Masters really contemporary art? Uh, yeah, I, yeah. That's that's also that's also part. I'm open to any good answer in this, and I think the future is 
is should be contemporary or not. I think um, yes, on this stage I would say yes, yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Okay, well, um, before before we move on to to questions and answers, yes. uh, please join me in thanking our our two our two speakers for a wonderful conversation. Thank you for having me. Well, we, uh, we, we now do have time for, uh, for questions um, to uh, Vim and, and Emily, uh, so I open it to the floor. Katie Barrett. Hello, that was a really fascinating conversation, thank you. Um, I wanted to take you back to the question of visitor numbers, because uh, um, a lot of what you've talked about is essentially being to do with tourists, it sounds like, and, um, well, uh, and there's certainly a big drive in British museums, as there should be, to, to attract visitor, British visitors who don't come to museums, who need very, we think, need quite different approach. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, how you balance those different kind of visitor needs. Um, I could talk about that. Uh, we have a very different situation, uh, largely driven by our locations. Uh, Amsterdam is a tourist magnet and a few tourists venture, actually 80 to 90 percent of the tourists to the Netherlands don't go to the Netherlands, they go to Amsterdam and they don't leave that city. So I think that's an important distinction to make. Uh, that having been said, we attract about half of our visitors from abroad and about half from the Netherlands. So in fact, you've got two different, you've got to put two different lenses on. The foreign visitors come for the permanent collection, for the icons, that needs to get out there, it needs to be made clear that this is a place you don't want to miss. But for our Dutch visitors, we need to create programming that will attract repeat visitors. And you do notice that most of your visitors are local, so most of mine come from The Hague and the regions, but they will venture farther away for exhibitions. So exhibition, it's different from this country, for exhibitions for us is, is a means of keeping it fresh, also, for our scholarship and keeping us uh, alive. Um, the, the, but I think there's an element missing in this conversation, and that's income. We do not have free entry here we, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we charge entry. Um, and that means that you have to work extra hard to make it worthwhile for people to come back. We took a decision to, I'm showing you our exhibition space, which is which is actually something I didn't come on to, but it's actually a very small exhibition space. It was a bit of an interesting choice, but our strength is our permanent collection and the fact that we are relatively small in scale. So I wanted to keep that in the exhibition space for us to keep it small, keep it edited, focused, but go into some depth. So we're not about the big, huge, you know, uh, enormous uh, shows, but we want to have things that really uh, go a little bit deeper, keep people in there longer. Um, but the exhibitions are not are the means to attract the Dutch visitors, but are not essential for generating income out of ticket sales as it can be here because of the free entry situation. So I think that's a distinction you, you, that needs to be made. Our situation is completely different in a way. I mean, yes, we are in Amsterdam, and that's a tourist magnet, um, and more and more growing all the time, especially since the three major museums are reopens, uh, the Van Gogh, the Stedelijk, and the, the Rijksmuseum. 50% um, of our visitors, a bit more, 55% of our visitors is Dutch. And I'm really very happy with that because in the past it was a complete different balance. And it's, there was even the risk that the Rijksmuseum would become a kind of tourist trap uh, with 70% tourist and only 30% uh, Dutch, because we have seen the Night Watch already. We've been there, done that. Uh, but now, as Emily says, we use the, 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 the idea of interventions by, by contemporary artists, and of course, we also do exhibitions to revitalize all the time the image and the whole life of the Rijksmuseum and to give people again and again a reason to revisit the Rijksmuseum, especially Dutch visitors. Um, and you're extremely effective in using the media. He's on yeah. TV all the time. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 my, my, when I came in the Rijksmuseum, I, I said every week we have to be in the newspaper, at least once a week. And the only reason to do so is that we 
uh, and it was at the time of the, of, the, of the building and the construction and all the problems. And I mean, there was every week there was another problem to, to uh, you could read in the, in the newspapers if you'd like. So I tried to change that and to, to, to be in the press, uh, fill the pipeline all the time. Because now and then you have, you have a problem, you have to cope with it, and journalists write all the time because they have to do, it's, the, it's their profession. Um, so fill that pipeline with new acquisitions, with new inventions, with research, uh, with, with anything you could think of and just do it all the time. So the good thing is that if something comes up that is not good news for the institution, next week there is, a, there's, there is good news to be shared. So, uh, but coming back on, on visitors numbers, um, we have about, and that's also something that changed, uh, we have about 350,000 kids and these are Dutch children and that's a lot. So um, I think that that is something that we that we are very proud of, uh, and we succeeded to do so because uh, the, the, it's in the curriculum, the, the history as well as, as as some of the artworks, the Night Watch, uh, the Van Gogh that we have, uh, the, the Vermeers. Um, so we, we and and to be on the on the school program, many many school kids come to the Rijksmuseum. So I'm very happy with that. And indeed, there is there is a lot of tourists coming, uh, more and more. And uh, I think yeah. you make a good point, and, and we were also very happy to see we had we flipped our uh, ratio from uh, we're now at about 50-50, but we were yeah. used to be 60% foreigners, 40% Dutch people. We turned that around after the opening, um, which is I think a very healthy development. Uh, you want to make sure that the people near you know and. and for us, of course, it helped hugely that people read in the newspaper that all these people in Tokyo were standing in line. We had no idea this was in our backyard. Yeah. It's amazing what you sometimes have to go overseas in order to make it yeah. clear. So 50-50 is, is a healthy balance. And as, yeah. as Emily said, I mean, indeed we need, uh, because visitors to us is also money, because, yeah, we need ticket income uh, as part of the budget. And that's... Uh, a question in the, in, in the back there. Jennifer, yeah. back. Thanks for that fascinating conversation. This question is for the director of the Reich Museum, if I'm pronouncing the name properly. How do you get to me the news every week? <laughs> uh, well, to, it's not so difficult. If you, have a, if you have a large institution with many people working um, and, and many enthusiast people working uh, who are really passionate about what they do, they do new inventions, and they, they, they write about things, and they do talks abroad, and they, they have new acquisitions, and they have new attributions. Um, so it's a kind of mindset that you really uh, use this, this phenomenon of being in the press. Um, and then after reopening, I said, well, one year after reopening, our policy changed, not every week in the press. So that's, that's because we now don't need it anymore. When I met Vim, I don't know if you remember this, he said to me, oh, with your face, you could be in the newspaper every day. Which I took as a great big compliment. Yeah, that was a compliment. <laughs> I did, I did. Uh, and I said, well, you know, uh, actually, I don't know why I would want to. <laughs> um, you know, I think I take a slightly different line. I'm a little more judicious about it, a little less. I'm a little more shy. Actually, you wouldn't know it from my big mouth here, but um, I. But you need it as, as you I mean, use it. You, 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 you are the use face it strategically. You use it strategically, and yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You and and for me, what's important is you go out there when you really got some news to tell. Yeah. And if you have a good journalist, they'll recognize that the news is. I think the flip side of it is, if you come out too often with things, you might get sort of superficial little stories that will distract from the important ones. Mm. So. Um, yeah. Vim told me just before we, we started this conversation that even museum directors have a real nightlife. <laughs> so this presumably Private feeds into... If it works, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Question in the middle there. Thank you very, for a very fascinating um, conversation this evening. Um, I saw the image of the girl with pearl earring and a crowd of people standing in front of it. And I was half expecting people holding up their mobile to take a photograph. And of course, there's differences in um, what museums' policies regarding photographs being taken. How do you feel about um, 
for, you know, sort of directing the public to look rather than record, to actually look at a painting, because I think no artist wants to exist in a, a photograph or in a digital image, as opposed to actually the whole point of making art is to educate people and not to just end up as an image. And also a lot of photographs and selfies being taken um, have been resulted in damage to art because people have kind of leant backwards to take a photograph of themselves. And this has happened in National Gallery. So how do you feel about um, taking that burden of like um, getting people to really look rather than um, interested in the number of uh, visitors? Right. Uh, let me uh, start with an anecdote. Uh, when I, I was actually living in London around 2000, and this is only about 15 years ago, and then that was a moment when most museums said, you know, website, okay, only if I have to, but all I'm putting on there is my visiting hours and uh, no pictures, because if we put pictures on the website, everyone will sit behind their computer and they won't come. It's 15 years ago. And I thought that was dead wrong, which led to a period in which I worked in new media because I thought that the rise of digital image, images would have an enormous impact on museums and on scholarship as well, uh, and that we should find a way to embrace that uh, rather than to, but you're not going to stop it. Fast forward now to, uh, in fact, just before we opened the Morris House, we had a very intense conversation exactly about this. Um, uh, and the way I did that was I, I actually set up a debate between the head of marketing and the head of security. And I said, okay, let's hear it. So yes, some of the points you made were made very eloquently by our head of security, who brought the example of the Van Gogh Museum, uh, who had initially allowed photography and then can't, then no longer do because it was too much of a burden, versus the head of marketing and uh, who said, you know, listen, uh, if you want people to come, this is the way it works nowadays, and uh, you know, you have to do this. Uh, we made a decision to allow photography. Uh, but we, I think it was a ju judicious decision. Uh, the security of the paintings are paramount. Um, in fact, sadly, we glaze all of our pictures, and it's partly for this reason, but it could also be a bag, or you know, there are various reasons. Um, we have serious, uh, we also have these small rooms, which actually turned out to be a blessing because you just can't get that many people in there. So people turning around to do selfies is very complicated and we, we keep an eye on that. So we, we said yes, but uh, the security of the paintings goes first. Uh, to come back to my anecdote, um, I think you can say, yeah, that's a real shame. You know, the artist didn't want someone to just take a quick snap. On the other hand, why are so many people coming? Why did they go to that Mona Lisa? Because they know the image. And the only way, I think, one of the main ways that you can introduce people to art in the first place is to get them in through, through one way or another. And, and really, the, in the end, it, it's, it should be about that confrontation with, with the original. Um, this is my final bridge. This is, was our opening campaign. I have a little film which I might show at the end, which is actually quite <laughs> amusing. But um, I'll, I'll show that in a moment. But you know, I really honestly think you, you, it doesn't work to fight it. Go with it. But use it in a way that it will encourage people to look. So I think my answer to your question is, yeah, go ahead. Find a way in. Get people to come in and look. I agree totally with that. I mean, we also embrace it. It has to do with a kind of, of ownership as well. I mean, if people like it, to do it, to show and to witness to others that they have been to the Rijksmuseum or the Mauritshuis or any other museum by making a selfie, I'm fine with that. Though at the same time, no flash and not disturbing other visitors. Um, and That's there, ex the there, ex part. there exactly is, is the balance. How do you balance that? Um, so, so far it works. Uh, but we're not going to forbid it. I think it's, it's, it belongs to our time. And um, funny enough, one, one day a year, we say, we say no pictures, because then at that time, at that certain date in October, we give everybody a sketchbook and a pencil for free and uh, to, to let people better watch, uh, because I think drawing is, is the ultimate way of understanding painting and understanding what you really see to, to have your mind and your hands 
uh, at the same time in control. Uh, so at that at that certain day, we we discourage to people to 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 let them make pictures. Anyway, it's still allowed, but we give as a kind of anti old-fashioned slow slow museum movement thing uh, sketchbooks and pencils and uh, the first day we did that two years ago uh, there were about 9,000 sketchbooks given to the audience so people really loved it and let their cameras or phones or whatever you call these things nowadays in, in their pockets so it's it's okay to me Wonderful. we have uh, four questions uh, first there please thank you for your conversation it's very inspiring um, I heard you say that the polarization of kind of like the best of the best artworks, so the best and the rest, that kind of stays in, in, in storage, sadly. Um, then you also said something about ma making it worthwhile to the visitors and kind of putting on different lenses um, for different visitors. Yeah. I'm curious about like the different lenses of um, catering to different visitors who have different experiences with going to museums, different levels of connoisseurship, different levels of education, but also different uh, approaches how to see art. Um, I'm, I'm curious in, in initiatives, I know about the, the Alain de Bouton uh, exhibition that was in the Rijksmuseum, art as therapy, really taking a different approach. I'm curious if you know of more examples uh, in your own institutions or globally, and if you think this is the way forward. I uh, absolutely do. Uh, the, the, um, and I think new media is the answer for this. Um, I personally, well, you should, I'm a bit of a purist about how the hang is perfect. So I'm not really interested in putting a lot of stuff or lights or things. But, you know, we now have this fantastic technology that will let um, people choose how, what they want to get out of their visit. So you reader, you read. You like to listen, you listen. And uh, we're not quite there yet, we're still <laughs> catching up, but um, what I would like to see is that, um, that you have the choice, you're in control. I mean, think about, we're so used to that now. If you, if you want, you, you, the change from it used to be, we're gonna tell you what's good for you and this is the right attribution, the right, you know, it was quite, and especially in the Netherlands, quite, you know, raised finger. Huh? Um, I, I want to go to a situation where you're interested in this subject, right. We're gonna help you find it, learn more about it. Uh, you might stumble on something the way that we used to do in OpenStack libraries, where you'd go for one book and you'd get distracted by another. I think this is the way that we need to do, and you can use that through, through these wonderful mediums that we have, film, uh, reading, listening. Uh, that having been said, I'd like to go back to a question we had earlier. These things need to be, uh, conceived in an intelligent way so that uh, it does encourage people to look and they can be done. I actually produced the first um, a multimedia tour. It was like an app before there was an iPhone uh, for Tate Modern years ago. And we spent a lot of time thinking about how you write the audio or write the program so that people actually get their eyes off of the machine and onto the object. There are ways of doing it, and, I, and I, I think it can really enhance the experience. And we all learn differently, so you should be able to offer people different approaches to do so. Uh, I have to say our app is still in, in, it's still in ba taking baby steps, but that's where I want to go with it. I want to be sure we get through questions, so if, mm -hmm. if, if, yeah. if we may just move on to the, to the lady who had a question up, up there, please. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The National Gallery uh, did uh, a series uh, some years ago where they had um, famous people like politicians, uh, sportsmen, or anybody uh, choose their favorite picture and wrote, uh, write about it. And that was a huge success. So maybe this is something you could also think about for your... That's indeed a good idea, and um, I must say that we already did that um, because it works and it's... it's also um, answers to, to what people nowadays want. They want to get familiar with it. And, and in marketing terms, you would say you have to put a face on it. So even an, an, um, an unknown masters or, or obscure paintings or whatever it is can be brought to life if you put a face on it. And that face could be by a well-known well, politician or... I, I, will, I will never make an exhibition with politicians, by the way. But anyway, that's another story. But, but by, by somebody who is famous for 
uh, whether if it's a philosopher like Alain de Botton or, or uh, an, an artist, a dancer or a musician or somebody with a bright mind having a clear and maybe a new vision and a new angle of looking at, 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 at art. And it could also be a contemporary artist to respond on, 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 on the collection of, in our case, the Rijksmuseum. But it, indeed, it's a good formula of, 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 of new ways of thinking. So let people think in a new way. That, that's good. I'll keep it brief. We're about to launch a program of our Thursday night directors, and there'll be sort of various people from various points of view who are, are names who offer different perspectives and therefore maybe introduce the audience to different objects or different ways of thinking about them. Uh, right there, somewhere. please. Thank you. Um, this is having had a couple of negative experiences recently with iconic art in European museums. This managing of the visitor experience so that one visitor doesn't disturb another what do you do about groups? About groups. 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 Groups where they march in in large numbers, they stand in front of a picture in a circle, usually in front of you if you're trying to look at it, and somebody harangues people for five minutes telling them stuff which they could see anyway if they use their eyes. Um, how do you manage that? Because what would, I what, 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 you what would be your suggestion? Beforehand. What would be your suggestion? I wonder if by prepping people beforehand, if you really want to go into a museum and see one room with the Klimt's or Guernica or whatever, uh, you should at least do a little bit of homework before you go and see it. And if you're going yeah. in a group, you know, okay. Come back and okay. So, in, but in practice, then there comes a group. Yeah. Who's asking them? Did you do your homework? <laughs> Director. <laughs> if you can manage this conflict in yeah, but the, between different sorts of visitors, because I think it's going yeah. to get worse. You, yeah. you've already said. I that. agree, and but I also have to confess that we don't have a proper answer for that yet. There are some things that we do. We have early opening hours for groups, get the, in as many yeah. groups as we can get through the museum. Um, in off hours, especially at peak periods. Um, the other thing is that we try to encourage people to come. For some reason, people nobody comes after three o'clock in the afternoon. They all come at eleven. You know, it's a good tip for you. That's Do also your museum a, yeah. visits in the afternoon when it's quieter. Um, you have quite a lot of control over the groups that actually do a group booking. What we what we run into, and I'm sure you do yeah. too. That, that we do it too. But, but, but still, this guides. problem exists yeah. and it's getting worse. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, but I mean, a group of sculpture. I mean, my first visit to the Rijksmuseum was in a group, a bouncy group of boys and girls after a three-hour bus drive from the north. So after, in that bus, I mean, you can imagine what happens when you're 12. You run through the galleries just like that. So um, it happens all the time. And, well, see what happens. I mean, so <laughs> I think... Yes, I mean, to a certain extent, we have to be aware that, that groups don't shout and that they behave and they use not uh, electronic uh, media to make more noise than necessarily, whatever. All through, and what Emily says is, I mean, if there is, we don't book group, uh, school groups at, at peak hour moments, uh, but still there are groups, uh, they come, unexpectedly and they are standing in front of of the milkmaid which is like this and they stand there well not the whole day but for 10 minutes exactly the same 10 minutes that you are there yeah i there's no answer for that sorry that's uh, just take yeah, your time i think we're, and we're, come back. we're a democratic institution time. you yeah. have to open your doors to everyone yeah. and you can't yeah. sort of tell people they can't come yeah. thank you thank you um, I have a question about legacy. Um, I study German museum directors for the first half of the 20th century, and they are well known for their um, modern approach, for their being very progressive. They're known as museum modernists. Um, for example, one of, one of the museums became the inspiration of the MoMA, is the story, the Kronprins of Palais in Berlin, Louvre of Justi. I had this idea we should have just a museum for contemporary art. Now, the question is, um, and it might be, might be too difficult to answer yet, but what do you think your legacy hmm. should be? Um, wow. <laughs> do you think oh, yeah. Dutch museums or museums in Western Europe or museums nowadays do have, do, are, are you setting a standard 
um, and maybe if not, uh, why not? But um, but also, well, how do you want us to to look back at this period, which sees quite revolutionary changes? And yes, what would you like your legacy to be? Thank you. This is typically a question that you're always afraid of that somebody is <laughs> asking that. <laughs> Thank you for that. However, I mean, it's not to me to decide what would be my legacy, though at the same time, uh, I mean, I, I'm stepping down as a director of the Rijks Museum, so I go to the next place, so I'm in the, in the, maybe not in the position, but I'm in the situation that I rethink what, what did I do and what did I bring to the, to the Rijks Museum, and I'm not the first and I'm not the last director, so there will be a, another one, as there always have been, Museums, uh, museum directors before me. So I hope that my legacy, and I can only say I hope, uh, because again, it's not up to me to decide what would be the legacy, but I hope that somebody and, and the audience uh, will write or think or whatever that I was the director that reopened the Rijks Museum and not reopened the building as such, but I also hope that the institution is more uh, in pace with the time and, and, and is really a 21st century museum open to a wide global contemporary audience. And open is, is key to, to anything that I tried to, to add to, to the rich history of the institution. Um. I know we're supposed to be provocative, but I'm <laughs> going to have to agree with just about everything you just said. Uh, I'm gonna show you one slide. I, you know, art historians like to work with pictures. This is my legacy. Mm -hmm. The gates open. Yeah. And very much the same, in the same line, you, you are a temporary guardian there. You're yeah. there for a moment. And when you're gone, no more invitations, no more special treatment. <laughs> it's just, you're just there for a moment. So you enjoy that moment and yeah. you do what you can. I had a very specific mandate when I arrived, which was do something about it. It's stuffy and old fashioned. And my answer was very similar to yours, which was in fact open out. And I think our answers today have been very much along those lines. You know, make sure that you have a, that, that your engagement with your audience is a two way street, not a one way direction. And I think that this slide illustrates that very well. Well, openness, which it strikes me is a, a, a major theme for museums, for the arts, for the humanities. Uh, a perfect topic on which to, to end. Um, a perfect topic for Humanitas, for the Vital Hoffman Trust, whom we thank again. And we thank both of our speakers, Emily Gordenka and Film Tribes. <laughs>